Hi everyone. Um, welcome to tonight's meeting hosted by the International Socialist Organization. Um, I'm Lauren. I'm a member of the IFO and I'll be chairing tonight's discussion on cops, class, and race, how to stop police violence. Um, if you are new to uh, coming to ISO events, we are a revolutionary socialist organization. We're committed to ending all forms of exploitation. Uh, not off to a good start. <laughs> all forms of exploitation and oppression, and we believe that black liberation is central to the project of building a new society. Um, just a note about tonight's discussion. Um, Curry's talk will be filmed. Thank you, Doug. But um, the discussion will will not be filmed, um, just for people's reference. Um, so, Curry is Curry Peterson Smith will be speaking. He is a longtime ISO member. Um, he was the author of the Black for Palestine Solidarity Statement, um, and is an activist in the Boston area. Um, thank you, William Curry. Thank you. Um, I know that you could have been at home watching Donald Trump, like if his speech. You know, I'm just gonna do my best to be like somewhere as articulate as he is right now um, to make it America great again. Um, okay, so that was a joke. Uh, on a more serious note, um, you know, I and I'm sure many of you uh, woke up today to see or hear the news about. Um, this brother named Charles Kinsey um, in Miami, Florida, who um, works with disabled people and was working with uh, an autistic man. Um, both, both of them are black. And um, the police apparently got a call and they showed up um, to these two men who were just out in the street. And Charles knew it was going to go down. And while the autistic man was sitting on the ground, Charles sat on the ground as well, and he put his hands up. And he said, my hands are up, don't shoot me. And the police shot him anyway. And uh, afterward, he asked, why did you shoot me? To this officer, you know, Charles survived. And the officer said, I don't know. Um, but that didn't stop him from handcuffing Charles, which I think is really significant, that even as he's been wounded, by a police officer's shot, a black man, unarmed, is considered criminal. Somehow a criminal threat to be restrained. Um, and I was thinking all day, um, after reading about Charles's story, and I know that I wasn't the only one, who was thinking, you know, please just don't let me be shot by the police today, you know? Um, and I know that um, so many people feel that way, so many people are afraid for our family members in this country right now. And so I just want to say that, um, first of all, to kind of acknowledge the weight that I think weighs on the society at the moment, um, and that I know in one way or another everybody in this room has some sense of, you know. But also to say that there's this is a particular kind of fear, the fear uh, that one has to be black in this country right now, um, the knowledge, it's not just an irrational fear, but it's a knowledge that we can be shot at any time, uh, and basically that the officers who, who commit that, uh, that act can do it with impunity. Um, and that particular kind of fear has a word, it's called terror, okay? Um, Terror is uh, a word that's thrown around a lot in this country, but they often don't define it. Terror isn't just fear. Like, I'm afraid of, like, snakes. You know what I mean? Like, that's different. That's an irrational fear. The police, unfortunately, is a, a, a thing to be rationally feared. Um, terror is when people act in a certain way deliberately to inspire fear. So, you know, of course, we're in the midst of this unending war on terror, and we hear the word terror all the time, but they never define exactly what terror is. Because if they did, then people would realize that the word terrorist doesn't just apply to Al-Qaeda, it does. 
but also applies to a lot of institutions that are very familiar to us. And I would argue the police are today and have historically been an instrument of terror in this country. Um, they do what states do, what governments do, which is rule uh, by a number of, of means, including terror. Um, and uh, I also checked today that uh, people may know that the Guardian newspaper has a feature called Accounted, where they're trying to keep track in some way of the number of people killed in this country by police. And as of today, uh, we were at 598 this year. It is on pace to exceed the number killed last year, which was just over 1,000 people killed by the police. So we're talking about, in a year and a half, over 1,500 people killed by the police. It's significant, I think, that it's a British news organization maintaining this count, not a US media outlet. Um, so that is this, this terror. It is a rational terror that is grounded in a nightmarish reality. And so it's something, too, that can't be swept under the rug, can't be ignored, because the Black Lives Matter movement has forced a new conversation about racism, about racist police violence, and about institutional racism. And it is a, a conversation that we have had uh, for the past few years now. It's um, kind of hard to uh, remember, um, but they used to, a few years back, and for, for several years since Obama's election, talk about this country as though, uh, well, they used the phrase post-racial society, that we had somehow gotten over racism and race because we had a black president. Nobody can seriously say that anymore. And that is 100% because of the Black Lives Matter movement. It has forced a new conversation about racism um, and about racist police violence in particular. But as we gather here tonight to discuss this crisis and how to understand it, we, of course, are not the only ones. There is a mainstream conversation also happening, trying to frame uh, uh, the, the, the crisis in, in police violence um, and so on. And it is being led by institutions that are not neutral parties. Um, it's being led uh, in the op-ed op pages of the New York Times and the LA Times and the Washington Post and so on. The, the mainstream US media who, whose, whose lack of neutrality I think is revealed whenever they cover a police murder, right? Because whenever they do so, when it comes to the actions of the police, it's always considered an isolated incident. Well, we don't want to jump to conclusions. We better get the facts. And then when the same thing happens again tomorrow, well, we don't want to jump to conclusions. We better get the facts. And yet those same media institutions all of a sudden have all of the skills of investigative journalism when it comes to investigating yeah. the lives of the black people yeah. who are killed yeah. themselves. Yeah. <laughs> that somehow, if um, a, a, a black person has a criminal record, has a drug charge, got in trouble in school, that those things are not isolated from their murder. They're somehow relevant to this question. So that's the media. Uh, it's being led by politicians, including the president, the Congress people, and so on. The same people who are not just neutral commentators uh, on the question of, of police violence, though I think they position themselves as such, but the people in the federal government who vote to arm the police, who have made deliberate decisions to uh, give them military weapons, and so on. So let's keep that in mind. That is the mainstream conversation. We're going to have a very different conversation today. Um, but uh, but let, me, let me start with the mainstream. I just want to read from an editorial from the LA Times a couple of days ago. And it's in response to the latest uh, shooting of police officers in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, which of course comes after the shooting of, of cops in Dallas. Um, and they said you know, that we have to, of course, condemn uh, uh, these acts. And they say, but ratcheting back the violence will require a better understanding of the nature and extent of the frictions among police officers in the communities they risk their lives to serve. It will require a deeper understanding of the real grievances of people who feel that the justice and political systems do not hear them. But it also will require patience. There are no instant solutions to the deep-rooted problems with race relations, over-policing, implicit bias and mistrust, civilians' easy access to military-style firearms, and other factors that have led the nation to this dysfunctional juncture. Meanwhile, the attacks in Baton Rouge and Dallas only heighten the sense of danger that police officers, trained to look out for their own safety as well as others, may feel as they interact with the public. 
So the, the list of things for which there are no easy solutions, according to the LA Times, um, deep-rooted problems with race relations, over-policing, implicit bias and mistrust, uh, these things are discussed as kind of phenomena, like things that happen, as opposed to the products of decisions that have been made by people and institutions, which they actually are. Um, and, of course, they assume that uh, not only will we have to live with these problems to some extent forever, but that we have to live with the police as an institution forever. We do not make that assumption in the ISO. I just want to put that out there. Um, and so I want to start, um, I want, I want to, to, to move on by talking a bit about, uh, just get, get into a bit more of what the mainstream conversation has looked like. Um, and the efforts of, I think, the most dominant voices, the most powerful voices, to frame this crisis of, uh, of, of racist police violence terrorizing black America. And of course, it's worth starting uh, with this, this slogan, this rallying cry of the right wing in response to Black Lives Matter, that blue lives matter. There's a lot of problems with this. <laughs> um, but um, you know, I would argue that this notion that blue lives matter and this kind of uh, slogan around which police organizations like police unions and uh, their supporters in the right wing, that this started, it coalesced in Ferguson, Missouri, right after uh, the police there murdered Mike Brown. And I say police plural because while Darren Wilson pulled the trigger that fired the gun that killed Michael Brown, it was actually a police department's decision to let his body lay in the, in the sun uh, for four and a half hours afterward. It wasn't just the question of Darren Wilson. Um, but uh, that said, the police, police officers in the police union in Ferguson made bracelets uh, to support Officer Wilson that said, I am Darren Wilson. Now, this of course is appropriating the phrase, I am Michael Brown, and before it, I am Trayvon Martin. Um, and the way that it was uh, framed is like, well, yeah, some people say I am Michael Brown, and some people say I am Darren Wilson. There's a significant difference between those two uh, people, right? Because to say that I am Trayvon Martin or I am Michael Brown, or to say that Black Lives Matter, is to call attention to a group of people experiencing oppression. It's a call to attention to an oppressed category, i.e. black people. There is no comparable framing for police. Police didn't come here in slave ships. Police didn't work on plantations. There was no history of laws saying that police had to use separate facilities in public and so on. All right, so, so there's a difference here. Um, uh, it isn't just that we have these two uh, groups of people. You have one group of oppressed people and then another group that is actually our oppressors, right? Um, so the, the notion that Blue Lives Matter, uh, that slogan is a slogan of the right wing. But there is a liberal version, I would argue, that makes a similar point. And um, it, it is, it's, being, it's a point that's made by the LA Times and by the Washington Post and by the New York Times, and I would argue uh, it actually starts with President Obama. And I just want to quote what he said um, uh, after the, the shooting in Dallas. Um, a shooting, just to say, uh, in, in whose aftermath, um, President Obama went to the funeral of the officers who were killed. Um, and I think just the, the most noteworthy point about that is that he hasn't gone to a single funeral of any of the mm -hmm. black folks killed by police, mm -hmm. even though, unfortunately, there have been many hundreds that he could have chosen from. So I just want to read what he said. <laughs> there is no doubt that the police departments still feel embattled and unjustly accused, and there is no doubt that minority communities, communities of color, still feel like it takes too long to do what's right. <laughs> we have to, as a country, sit down and just grind it out, solve these problems. And so, in this version of events, he's, you know, he and, and not just Obama, but you know, the media and so on, are talking as though black people and police are like two groups of people who happened to encounter each other in the past few years. It's just like a misunderstanding that we have to work out. You know, as though black people are somehow like a new population to this country, when in fact we've been here for 400 years. Um, and it hasn't been like a nice 400 years. Um, we've been on the bottom of the society 
uh, starting, of course, with slavery, um, which was followed by Jim Crow segregation. There's a whole history of lynching, um, and more recently, the war on drugs and mass incarceration has been primarily uh, directed at the black population. Now, those last two things, the war on drugs and mass incarceration, I think for people in, in, in my generation, it's hard to imagine a world that's not characterized by constant surveillance and mass incarceration and knowing that one in three black men uh, will spend some time incarcerated in our lifetimes. Um, but that's actually a recent feature of uh, American life, of American capitalism. The fact that the US has the world's biggest prison population uh, is actually recent. It is the latest strategy, I would argue, that is aimed at controlling the black population, but it is one in a series um, of strategies. Um, and so I want to, to go back uh, to just historically um, and, and first say that in any society, the people who are in charge of it, who rule it, have to devise a way to maintain their rule. They have to devise a number of ways. And the question of the black population in this country, from the very start, actually from before when it was a country, um, has, been, has posed a problem for the people who, who run this society. Um, a problem, of course, because of the place that they want us in, which is at the bottom. And uh, Thomas Jefferson, who um, we know as a founding father, slave owner, um, he wrote uh, a letter that I, that I always come back to. Um, he, he wrote a letter uh, to another statesman uh, where they were discussing the question of slavery and his kind of dilemma um, in terms of emancipation and uh, how it was such a difficult problem. He said, it's as though we are holding a wolf by the ears and we can neither safely hold on to him or let him go. You know, these are the words of a slave owner. They're the words of somebody who assumes that the wolf has to be held down, right? Who can't envision uh, liberation because of, of, of black folks because that would threaten the very, his very existence as a slave-owning, uh, property-holding, uh, powerful person. Um, and yet, this kind of, the, 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 there was a certain knowledge that if we're going to found this country with this group of people at the bottom, then we will always have to manage it as a potential threat, right? Okay, so with that, I wanna talk about the police. Um, and just to say at the beginning, the police as we understand them is an institution that's only a couple hundred years old. It's one of many things that I think we take for granted as this natural kind of thing, but in fact there's nothing uh, uh, natural about it. While there has been law for, um, for many centuries, this particular configuration where you have a standing group of people who walk around and patrol neighborhoods armed all the time to you know, supposedly enforce a law, um, combined with courts in a prison system, like this particular arrangement is actually a fairly recent one in, um, in, uh, in human history, actually. Not just US history, but human history. Um, and it's worth kind of acknowledging that and, and naming these things that we kind of take for granted because their violence is so normalized that we just come to accept it. Um, uh, it's, it's, it's funny, you know, they talk about, uh, they, they cast at the moment, they're casting Black Lives Matter as somehow this violent threat. But I don't know how many of y'all were at the, um, the protest last Wednesday in Roxbury, which is amazing. You know, there was one group of people who showed up armed at that protest. That was the Boston Police Department, right? Um, but the media didn't report that. They weren't like, hey, there was a group of people with guns, you know, because their, their violence is kind of the everyday violence of, of uh, you know, running the society, right? So the, the modern police emerged um, in uh, London, England, uh, in the southern United States, and in New England. And actually, um, as those of us who reside in Boston may know, may notice, um, on the cover or on the, on the front of the Boston Police headquarters, there are banners that say Boston Police First in the Nation. Because technically, Boston Police Department was the first one, uh, first modern incorporated uh, police department in the United States. Um, so, uh, I want to talk a bit about what was significant about these places that provided for the emergence of the police, of the modern police. Um, but uh, let me uh, start by saying that the police as we know them today actually emerged from earlier uh, bodies of armed men. And one of those uh, important uh, groups was slave patrols in the South. 
that is, groups of men who would patrol armed to look for uh, runaway slaves, um, and so on. And I think that it is important to not only remember the, or the early origins of the police as being in slavery and in managing the enslaved population of black people, but also to, to think about that historical analogy today. Um, because, you know, when, when the police murder uh, a black person today, the default response of the media and the mainstream is kind of like, well, what, were, you know, what was the situation? What, were, what, were the, what was the black person doing that led to this? So think about it, like, think about like, a slave patrol. The question, you know, if the, the, they like shot, you know, an enslaved black person, the question isn't like, well, what was the slave doing? <laughs> it's like, they have a role, yeah. which is to maintain slavery, to maintain a status quo that is inherently oppressive to a group of people. And I think that that same kind of analogy um, has relevance today. Um, it's important because it's not just that the mainstream argues that. I think that we can accept some of those ideas, can internalize them. You know what I mean? I think particularly, you know, there's this notion of black on black crime. Um, and, you know, I thought the rally last week was incredible. But one of the things that folks were saying, and I think folks have been saying for the past few years of Black Lives Matter is, yeah, the police are bad, but, you know, we, you know, we give them a reason to come in. You know what I mean? Because of the crimes that, that, are, that are in our communities. And I think that that's actually an internalization of racist ideas about our criminality that are promoted all the time. And again, you wouldn't say the same thing. We wouldn't accept that kind of logic applied to enslaved people, right? Right. Okay, so, um, so the modern police, um, uh, you know, they have their origins in things like slave patrols, but the notion of a standing body of armed people who are meant to walk around patrolling a city, um, you know, it actually comes out of, uh, uh, out of the, the early cities uh, in, in the 13 colonies and then in London, which are the places where you have plantation uh, uh, slavery um, in the south, in the southern United States, and the cities that we're talking about, cities like Charleston, uh, for example, were places that exported cotton, right? And so there was all kinds of new and emerging industry uh, both coming out of those places and converging. You have uh, not only the cotton uh, and other crops being grown on the plantations, but then there are workers who are bringing those things into the city. There are people who are building ships so that they can ship uh, uh, the, the, these raw materials up to New England where we live and process those uh, uh, as manufactured textiles um, uh, and so on. And so you have the emergence of actually new forms of labor. Um, you have a, a situation where uh, it, it becomes profitable for slave owners to actually lend out their slaves to work for artisans, for shipbuilders, for example, or to uh, uh, work as enslaved labor, helping to load uh, cotton on the ships and so on. And so you have new forms of labor coming together in the cities. Um, and you have, uh, when, when, when workers come together in a certain place, that provides, that, that provides for a problem for the people who are running things. Because workers come together and they're like, wait a minute. <laughs> I'm seeing all this cotton going up north. I'm seeing the wealth that's being accumulated here, and I'm not getting it. And if you're enslaved, you're definitely not getting it, right? Um, and so, uh, and there were slave revolts uh, also that, that, that uh, characterized um, early colonial life in this country. And so the modern police forces really were meant to be a body to manage these new forms of labor. Um, it, it, it's, it's funny because, of course, today the police uh, are understood as law enforcement who are meant to stop crime. But um, there, there's a, a comrade of ours named David Whitehouse who's in uh, the ISO out in the Bay Area. He's done a bunch of research on the, the, the history of the police. He points out that actually for the first 50 years of their existence, police departments didn't have detectives. Like the idea of there being somebody on staff whose job is to like investigate crime didn't actually exist. The key feature of the police departments were armed patrols. The question of criminality and managing crime actually came later. This was about managing an urban uh, population. Um, and uh, as capitalism further developed in this country, uh, and as workers further got together and began to strike and otherwise fight back, uh, the police, uh, that, that became managing uh, workers' unrest became a central part of the role of police departments as well. Um, people may know that uh, corporations used to have their own private police. Um, like the Pinkertons and so on, they became incorporated into public uh, police departments. So that is really the origins of police. It's about managing 
labor. And um, uh, I want you to uh, imagine a pyramid, like a social pyramid, right, uh, of a society with, uh, you know, a tiny point on top and a big base at the bottom, all right? On top of the people in power, on the bottom are the majority of us exploited. And the police, you know, imagine a line somewhere on the pyramid, could be in the middle, could be two-thirds up or down or whatever, could be a blue line if you want. <laughs> um, but that is really, the police are a layer of people, a social layer, a force, whose job it is to maintain the hierarchy of that pyramid. And I think it's important to understand that because conventional wisdom says that police are like work workers, they're working class, maybe because they come from working class families, or because like we all go to Dunkin' Donuts or whatever. Um, <laughs> You know, we, you know that, that, those things are true, like, you know, there, there are cops who come from working class kind of families and you do see them in Dunkin' Donuts or whatever. But, um, but actually, the key thing is that they play a particular role, uh, a social role, in terms of maintaining a hierarchy in the society. And, you know, if you ever, the, the best way to kind of reveal the nature of different groups in society <laughs> is when people start to fight back. That's incredibly clarifying. I don't know how many people here have ever been to a picket line when workers are on strike. But it's really interesting, because the ones I've been to, you know, you'll have these workers who are trying to, they're in front of a workplace, they're trying to prevent uh, scab labor, you know, um, uh, people who are going to go in and do their jobs and try to break the strike. And, um, you know, before a car of, of, of scabs uh, comes in, you know, the cops are there. The workers are there. They might be talking to each other. They might have cups of Dunkin' Donuts or whatever. <laughs> Things might be cool. And then the scabs come in, and the workers go to block the scabs, and the cops <coughs> go to prevent the workers from doing that. That's incredibly clarifying uh, what they're there for. They're not there to hang out or fraternize, but they're there because they're on the side of the bosses. They're against the strike, um, uh, actually. Um, and. I think in general, if you've been to a protest and you see the role of the police play, that's incredibly clarifying. Because it's consistent. Like, you know, the, the idea that, that, that we're told is that the police are somehow like this neutral group of people who show up to maintain order in like a neutral way. But every demonstration I've been on that's been attacked by the police, it's always the left and progressives who are attacked by the police. It's not like random. It's not like sometimes they go after the left, sometimes they go after the right. I've been to, um, and uh, folks um, in this room have been to a lot of protests against the far right, like Nazis have come to march in Boston. We've got stories for you after the meeting, so you want to talk about that. But every time I've been to a protest like that, where the Nazis come and our side mobilizes to stop the Nazis, the police have a role, and it is maintaining the Nazis' free speech. That is, the cops march in, and the Nazis are behind them. They have never been there to maintain our free, you know what I mean? It's not like, oh, sometimes they protect the Nazis and sometimes it's us. It's, it's consistently um, uh, the far right. Um, that is true for anti-immigrant protesters um, uh, and so on. Um, and, uh, you know, in fact, for a long time uh, in the history of this country, particularly in the South, it was common knowledge, it was common kind of open secret that the very police officers who wore a badge during the day wore the Klan hood uh, and robe at night. That is, the Ku Klux Klan and the police were actually the same people, right? Um, and so they consistently defend the right wing and protect the right wing because right wing ideas buttress the society that the police's job uh, it is to maintain in general anyway. And conversely, that's why they're consistently against uh, black people, indigenous people, who by the way are killed at a very similar rate as black people by the police. Um, women, if you know, uh, and, you know, I'm, I'm sure people in this room um, are intimately familiar with how the police treat things like intimate partner violence, sexual violence, and so on, um, uh, that, that affect uh, women um, in, in, a, in a particular primary way, um, LGBT people, and it is why poor white folks are also in the prisons of this country. Uh, uh, that is, the people on the bottom of that pyramid are always the people targeted uh, by the police. So that's their role, um, to, maintain, to, to use violence to maintain the status quo. Um, to make sure, and the status quo, to be clear what it is, is that most of us are exploited, most of us are oppressed, um, uh, and the wheels of capitalism keep on turning, and so on. So, um, let's go back to the pyramid. And, you know, I've, I've talked a bunch about the police in that line somewhere in the middle, but who's on top of the pyramid? 
course, that's rich and powerful people. Now, historically, you know, when, when this country started, 100% of the people at the top of that pyramid were white men. Um, you know, the U.S. always, in history books, they always talk about like, the March of Progress. And, like, what the March of Progress means is, like, now, there's a few women at the top who get to exploit you. you know? There's a few black folk, you know, like, like the, that the group of exploiting parasites, you know, is slightly more diverse. Slightly, um, but, but there's a significance there. And I, I just, I think it's worth talking about what the top of that pyramid looks like today if we're in a conversation about race and class and police. Because we can't have an honest conversation about the Black Lives Matter movement without acknowledging the fact that it has been presided over by a black president. Or that when there was an uprising in Baltimore last year, the people in charge were a black female mayor, a black police commissioner, and the black female mayor, by the way, called the, the, the protesters thugs, right? Um, or uh, the fact that, you know, John L. Lewis, who has been an inspiration to so many people, this is a man who was a civil rights leader, who's now a congressman, who most recently has used his voice to talk about why we need to support the police, right? So regardless of how you get there, where you come from, when you end up in the top of that pyramid, you have a role to play, right? Um, uh, and I, I just think that that's, that's important to, to acknowledge. I'll throw that out there for the discussion. That's the top of the pyramid. Conversely, on the bottom of the pyramid, we know that black folks are a particular target for the police and the violence of the society. But we know that there are more than just black folks at the bottom of that pyramid, right? It is the argument of socialists that all of us at the bottom have an interest actually in uniting and fighting against, that whole, against the whole pyramid. We don't want a situation where there's a minority of people on top and we're excluded on the bottom, we're oppressed on the bottom. And so we all have an interest in actually overcoming police violence and truthfully overcoming uh, the police in general. Um, and so uh, I'll say that. Let me make uh, one other quick point before wrapping up because the, the, the point that I'm trying to get at in conclusion is that if we're talking about stopping racist police violence, we can't look at it purely in isolation. It is actually part of a larger social structure in this country and beyond this country. That is, I think we have to say something also about U.S. imperialism, U.S. empire. I mean, the um, you know in Dallas, the way this like shooting situation, the, the, this this gunman. Um, well, first of all, let, let me back it up. Before I talk about how, how that guy was killed, let me talk about the fact that the two shooters in Dallas and Baton Rouge were soldiers, right? I mean, we have to acknowledge the fact that for 15 years now, tens of thousands of people have cycled through combat zones. And then they're like, we don't know why there's mass shootings. You know, it's like, you know, let, let, let's talk about the nature of violence in this country and how, you know, the, the fact that it is a country perpetually at war is, is crucially uh, relevant. Um, but that said, um, when, uh, when the, the way that they resolved uh, this, this situation in Dallas when um, somebody who had nothing to do, no relationship with the Black Lives Matter movement, opened fire on police officers in that city, the way they dealt with him was not by arresting him, not by putting him on trial, but in an extrajudicial way, killing him with a drone strike. That is something that the United States does in Pakistan, in Yemen, in Somalia, in Iraq, and elsewhere all the time. And these things don't just stay over there, they come back here. In fact, um, one of the, uh, I think, most significant victories that the Black Lives Matter movement uh, has achieved took place in Chicago, where um, there is this horrific history of police torture of black folks over years starting in the late 70s and continuing up through the 90s, and many dozens of primarily black men, though I think women as well, were taken to a particular precinct, picked up on the streets, taken to a particular precinct in Chicago, and tortured for years. And one of the victories of the Black Lives Matter movement is that finally the city of Chicago was forced to apologize for this after many years of struggle um, uh, uh, against this, this, this violence. It was the Black Lives Matter movement that finally pushed things over the edge and forced an apology from the city of Chicago, forced some reparations for uh, the victims, the surviving victims of that police torture, and forced uh, them to say something in uh, textbooks that are, that are produced uh, on the history of Chicago that are taught in Chicago public schools. Well, 
Um, that torture ring was led by a man named John Burge, who uh, right now is enjoying a nice police officer's pension uh, in Florida. Um, but the cops who worked under him, him and the cops who, 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 who were part of this torture uh, system, it turns out that many of them learned to torture as soldiers in the Vietnam War. They took what they learned to torture Vietnamese people and brought it back uh, uh, against black people uh, in this country. So these things are linked. And actually, um, there's a, people may know about uh, a sister named Asada Shakur, um, who is a revolutionary uh, uh, black socialist um, from the 1960s, who I think has come to enjoy a new growing popularity in the Black Lives Matter movement, which is incredibly exciting. And one of the things that she said, and I'm, I'm paraphrasing, is that any group of oppressed people who's serious about its own freedom has to be concerned with the freedom of other oppressed people as well. And she was talking about that in particular in relation to the question of imperialism. And she said, anytime no. one of US imperialism's tentacles is cut off no. somewhere else, that is a victory for black people um, uh, as well. And so really, the interests and the fates of all oppressed people are bound uh, together. So I want to end, um, because I want to get to this discussion, um, and I want to say that the police it's not just that they, they came out, uh, they, they're only uh, uh, coming out of recent history, but that recent history is the history of the emergence of capitalism. The development of capitalism uh, and the development of the, of the police uh, go hand in hand uh, together. We think that it is possible to have a world without police because we think it's possible to have a world without capitalism. That is uh, our vision. It is a question of black liberation as a central part of the liberation of all oppressed people. Um, and so, uh, you know, I think it's, it's important now that I think we're in a new kind of wave in the Black Lives Matter movement to remember one of the best chants of the Black Lives Matter movement. I don't know if folks remember, uh, uh, if you've been in, in the streets for the past year or so, there's one chant that we would do that goes, I believe that we can win. I believe that we can win. And when we talk about winning, Yes, we want to win some reforms to push back uh, the incredible racist violence that we deal with on a daily basis. But in the end, what we're talking about winning is liberation. Mm -hmm.